Thank you, Catherine, and thanks again to the Minister who, who has had to leave us. Uh, can I just say for the record that I am not one of the three. Um, uh, I, I, suspect, I suspect I have been in rooms where the proportion has been higher than one in 20, but that was when I was much younger. Um, I was interested, Catherine, in what you, when you talked about evidence and you talked about uh, the various sources of evidence and you spoke about, about research and statistics and so on. Um, but I was also interested when you talked about uh, attending the Joint Oireachtas Committee and, and the democratic process and so on. I think one of the most valuable sources of evidence is from the, the practitioners, the people who work in society and the people who have to implement our policies and who have to deal with the, the, with the results of those policies. So I think there has to be a way in which we can gather that evidence. Of course, it's important then to decide how you interpret it and what you, what you make of it. Anyway, um, our, our next speaker, uh, has had a very distinguished career. Um, he's uh, a consultant, uh, an author. He has studied, researched, written uh, about and implemented drug policy for almost 20 years. He may be unique in that he has, I think, served three uh, US presidential uh, administrations and may be unique also in that he has served both uh, a Democrat and Republican administration. So if he can do that, I suspect he has a lot to offer. Um, He's been featured on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, he's been on virtually every major media publication and news channel on the subject of drugs policy. Um, in 2013, he founded Project SAM, Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Um, and he is director of the Drugs Policy Unit at the University of Florida. He's come a long way to talk to us, so will you give a warm welcome, please, to Dr. Kevin Sebesh. Thanks. Well, I want to thank uh, the chair for, for opening up and, and thank Cad for inviting me, Bernie, and really all the staff uh, who uh, uh, put all this on. The flight was nothing. I was in Melbourne uh, last week. That was a lot worse. So this was six hours from the East Coast. It was great. Um, it's my first time in, in Ireland, and I went to university or did my postgraduate in England and uh, unfortunately never, never made it here, and uh, it's really a shame because already I've been here less than 24 hours, and the, just the generosity and, and the spirit of everyone here is very, um, very encouraging, so I'm very happy to be here. Let's see if I can bring up my, my PowerPoint. I should be able to do that. Um, you know, the, the, the first thing I want to say, well, for, obviously I want to thanks the, thank the drugs minister he had to leave for coming. We had a, a discussion where uh, the producer really wanted us to go at each other. I mean, he was saying, you know, let's find the two things that you vehemently disagree on. And we sort of looked at each other and said, well, we actually want to find the things that we agree on <laughs> uh, because we think that'll move policy forward. And really, um, we may disagree on some terminology and some things on the margins. And, and obviously, we have some, some fundamental disagreements. But we also had a lot of fundamental agreement on, on things. And it was just nice that he was able, able to come. But um, I think oftentimes in this whole discussion, we get into the sound bites and shouting matches. And, uh, you know, I, was, uh, I learned in Washington from an old political hack that if you can't fit a policy on a bumper sticker, then you have no chance. And that's really depressing, actually, because our issue is not, does not fit on a bumper sticker. It's a, com it's a complex one. And I know we throw these terms around like decriminalization, harm minimization, this and that. But I would urge all of you to actually avoid those terms as much as possible and talk about things specifically to you within context, um, because I think when we don't do that, we sort of lose a greater understanding, and we end up uh, thinking that we disagree when we don't, and we agree when we don't, and it just, it just is, not, is not helpful. And when I looked at the, um, you know, I'm glad the minister was here, and I'm glad others are here, but actually, I'm most happy just in terms of all the participants, because I looked at all of your backgrounds and where you were coming from. You're on the front lines, and you are dealing with this issue every single day with, you know, not a lot of notoriety, I know that. Um, I have a feeling it's similar to the U.S. It's not exactly the most lucrative occupation. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, 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 actually, it would be much more lucrative if you were on the other side of this after I show you about the private equity investors getting involved in the marijuana business. Um, it's going to be shocking to you, I think, um, as it is when I talk around, about this issue around the world and around the U.S. But you're on the front lines dealing with this. And I want to not just talk about this in an academic way. You can read the studies yourself. Um, I want to talk about this in a way that you can, I hope to give you a few nuggets that you can then pass on to, you know, the youth that you work with that says cannabis is not 
addictive. I mean, I had someone say that to me the other day, uh, a 15-year-old in the audience. He said, Kevin, uh, you know, I know that cannabis is not addictive, and I know that for a fact. And I said, really, how do you know that? And he said, well, I know it because I use it every day. Um, these are the mytho this is the mythology that we have to deal with, that you deal with. And um, it's not helped when in the media and a lot of our politicians are throwing out these things like decriminalization and legalization. The message that are being sent is that we don't really care, um, that this is not an issue. And it's also, frankly, not helped because I think a lot of, you know, we sort of like to blame youth, but I actually, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll blame maybe the older generation because I think oftentimes parents don't quite understand that the cannabis that they used for fun at uni 20 years ago is not exactly the same cannabis that you know, their, their son or daughter is trying and is using. And um, they have such, uh, you know, there, there are outdated thoughts about drug use. Uh, I was at a school in the central, in the corn belt of the United States, in central Iowa, and I was speaking to 1,000 15-year-olds, 15, 16, 17. And when they were introducing me, they said, and I don't know if the terminology is going to translate here, but I'm going to try anyway. They said, Dr. Sabet is going to come up right now and speak to you about that roach clip that gets passed around at your parties. Now, I don't know if that term was ever used here, but it hasn't been used in the U.S. since you know, 1979, okay? So these, these 15 years, they have no idea. They were like, they thought it was some kind of insect extermination technique I was going to talk about. They had no idea that it was about cannabis. And then you had the guy in the back seat the 15-year-old, the sort of a bit of a troublemaker, I think, sitting in the corner, raising his hand. He said, well, is, is Dr. Sabet going to be talking about dabbing? And this poor woman in, in her you know, sort of mid to late 60s, who was the vice principal, vice head of the school, she, was, she said, what? I said, well, is he going to talk about dabbing? Because you said he was going to talk about cannabis. Is he going to talk specifically about death? And she said, I have no idea what you're talking about. You know, just, 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 just you, know, you be quiet, and we're going to bring the speaker on. But for me, and I'll explain what dabbing is a little bit later if you're wondering also, but for me, this was a great example of the disconnect in, um, that, that we are often seeing. And uh, we're not sort of updating our terms and what we're doing. I don't want to really talk a lot. I did put a few slides about the organization that uh, I found. And I have to say, I'm bringing very, very hearty greetings from uh, my colleague in this work, Patrick Kennedy. Obviously, he uh, feels um, a, 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 uh, an affection for, for this country and was actually very sorry he couldn't come with me. Um, he actually just released a book last week. He's on a book tour in the US that he's getting a lot of, uh, frankly, his, his family's not so happy about the book he released. Not because it's a tell-all of gossip and secrets, but actually it's a frank discussion about the disease of addiction and mental illness. It's a frank discussion about the number one thing you all know, but we don't like to admit, which is that denial is the hallmark of addiction, right? Denial is what all of this is about, whether it's society denying that there's a problem, whether it's a community or a family or an individual denying it. And he talks about it very frankly, and, and you know, his half-brother and others aren't very happy about what he had to say. Um, but I think he's very courageous for doing so. He's also courageous for breaking maybe from the very liberal wing of his party and talking about this issue cannabis head on and saying that the last thing we want to do is enrich a new industry, a cannabis industry, because this is what this is about, folks. I mean, you can play around with terms like decriminalization. Let's look at the end game. I mean, we've talked about decriminalization 20 years ago in the US, and the same people who said, this is not about legalization. No, 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 no. The same people who were funding it, not the people in the, in the field who were maybe genuine in their, in their support, but the people behind the debate who were funding it and pulling the strings, they're the exact same people today that are saying, actually, you know what, it doesn't really confirm. We need legalization now. You know, we sort of changed our mind. So let's remember what the end game is. And, um, you know, so anyway, so, so Patrick was, had, the, had the courage. When I left um, the White House, we founded this group called SAM, which is a nonprofit organization that we want to educate society on the harms of today's marijuana. And we want to talk about, look, we don't want to give somebody, and I told the minister this, we don't want to give somebody a, you know, a 17 year old a criminal record for a joint in his pocket, and then so he can't get a job when he's 25 or 30. We, we know that that's counterproductive. But at the same time, the, the choice isn't between that or simply letting it go and ignoring this as an issue and thinking that you know, this will sort of go away. We have to confront this, and frankly, it means government has to you know, put some investment into this. Um, we need to, you know, uh, uh, confront this issue head on and treat it, if you want to treat it like a health issue, because, you know, I love it when people say, let's treat drugs like a health issue, 
and just give someone a, you know, uh, in the U.S., you know, a $50 fine and have them forget about it. Well, wait a minute. Can you imagine treating any other health, health issue like that? You know, saying that we're not going to follow up with care and follow up with what's happening. So if you want, we want to treat it. And I was really um, uh, impressed by uh, uh, Professor and Catherine. Thank you so much for your words about sort of a pro-health policy. We have to think about what that really means. And so we started this organization to do that, to really inform public policy. And we're um, sort of backed by lead the leading health authorities. I am going to be speaking today very quickly, and um, I know over a lot of information, but I, what I wanted to tell you is I wrote a book um, that I tried to write at sort of primary grade level just because I want, you know, we wanted the masses to get it. I, on purpose, rejected contracts from academic publishers because I did not want to write an academic book. Um, but I wanted to write a book where still, although the language is, I hope, hopefully easy to understand, almost every single sentence is cited with a peer-reviewed scientific study. So it's sort of a hybrid of academic, non-academic, and it's called Reefer Sanity, uh, Seven Great Myths About Marijuana. And I'm not able to go through all of the myths today, um, but the myths include, you know, this is harmless and non-addictive, it's medicine, um, you know, we can regulate it and get some tax revenue from it and pay for education. You know, I love hearing that. I, you know, I... I um, I don't know about here, but when I go to different U.S. states, we have the lottery, which I'm sure you have something similar. Okay. And then in the lottery, you know, uh, we were told that was supposed to save public education. Well, I'm still waiting for that to happen, right? We were told alcohol and tobacco taxes were going to fund <coughs> free counseling treatment for anybody who ever needs it. And I'll tell you, I don't know about what it's like here, but I'll tell you in the U.S., that's certainly not the case. So there are all these fallacies that are out there about this issue, and I, and I talk about them in this book and um, in a much more, I think, in a more thorough way, but in a way that I think is pretty easy to understand. It's really a book that you give to, you give to your 15-year-old who doesn't want to believe the science and doesn't want to believe this issue. Um, it's just amazing out there, the misinformation. And really, I'm here to tell you that this is not a coincidence of misinformation. This is misinformation deliberately put out there by an industry, frankly, that wants to look like this very soon, right? An industry whose business it is to addict people. And you say, well, well how is that the case? Um, well, that's the case because that's the economics of drug taking, folks. A small number of people consume the vast majority of the product whether that's alcohol or any other drugs, actually. I mean, most drugs, people try a few times, they're done. They're not going to go on to it. The chronically addicted, those are the ones using, and if you look at the very far right graph, consumption, those are the ones who are using almost every day. That black, the black and the striped, those are people who, who actually, this is European data, who use marijuana nearly every single day. And they're only, if you look at the far left, they only represent 20% of the past year users, right? So a small number of, the, of everyone who's tried cannabis in the past year are consuming on the far right the vast majority of the, in terms of the consumption, the bulk of the product. What does that mean if you're in this business? It means that you your profit is taken from the people on the far right. Your profit is consumption, right? So if you're an alcohol business, right, if you're the alcohol industry, this is the same thing here as it is in the U.S., you absolutely rely on heavy drinkers for your profit. So I don't know if you have the slogan here, but we have a slogan they like to say, enjoy responsibly. I don't know if you have that here. Okay. It, do you know that if everybody enjoyed responsibly, you'd have no alcohol industry? I mean, that's the irony. The industry's saying enjoy because they know that it's not realistic. And so... Obviously, you want to save face and put that up there. You're sort of forced to by government. But the, the point is, um, this is these, these industries rely on irresponsibility. That's the only way they make money. Gambling, the gambling industry relies on irresponsibility. They don't rely on the person who goes once a year or whatever, bets on something. They rely on the person a day after day after day after day. And if you've been to you know, places like Las Vegas in the U.S. or um, you know, Atlantic City, although Atlantic City is shutting down now because they thought the gambling industry was going to save the state. Instead, it's bankrupted the state. They have to call, you know, Donald Trump isn't making a lot of money over there. He's investing in other things right now. God help us. But, um, but if you look at, you know, places like Las Vegas and you look at the gambling establishments, Right? Who gets the upgrade to the three-bedroom penthouse top floor suite? <laughs> it's not the person that goes and plays a round of roulette once a year on their birthday, $50 and done. 
right? It's the person who the front desk knows by first name, on a first name basis because they're there every day betting their life savings. Well, folks, it's the same thing with these other addictive industries. And I'm really here to tell you that um, you know, there is a growing industry, and people think that cannabis is about the hippies. You know, I don't know about the, the history here, but you know, in the US, the hippies and the you know guys with long hair and the the hemp T-shirts and things like that. And I'm here to tell you that, folks, that is not the face of really of the business of cannabis today. The face of the business of cannabis look a lot like clean cut guys like this, right? They're guys that have Rhodes Scholars that were Rhodes Scholars at Oxford, have Ivy League MBAs from Yale and are there to be the next billionaire business people. And they love the fact that countries in Europe are having a debate about relaxing drug policy because that's the same debate we had in the US 10 years ago. And in the US, they're already making their tens of millions of dollars and they see other global markets are, are gonna be next for them. And it's not just these three, I'm sort of, the, these are three real people who are doing this, but there are, there are many others. My point is they are very savvy people. They cut their hair and they got new suits and they press their shirts, okay? Um, this is not the 60s hippies that you know, we're so worried about. You know, God bless the 60s hippies. This is not about them, right? It's about the guys that, this is what scares me. It's about the guys that, um, that, that really know what they're talking about. In fact, they've even been able to co-opt the you know, sort of worldwide uh, hero of rebellion, um, Bob Marley, by, by, I don't know if you knew this, buying the name Marley. Now, if you ever use the word Marley in a product, it's not the widow of Bob Marley that gets to collect the royalties because these guys paid the widow of Bob Marley $50 million in order to use the name. So now they're creating, what is it? They're creating pre-rolled cigarettes, cannabis cigarettes that they're introducing to markets in the US and they're just waiting to introduce it to markets in Europe. Now you look at the word natural, right? Isn't that amazing? It's like we have these alcohol ads, they say vodka and you know, diet cranberry, the low carb alternative. You know, they have a picture of a really skinny you know, 20 year old or 21 year old there. Um, it's the same sort of thing, right? It's sort of this idea. And you've probably heard that from maybe some of your, um, the, the people you counsel or some of the families. This is natural, right? This comes from God. That's what I heard. It comes from the ground. Do you know what else comes from God? Poison ivy and hemlock. You, you know, so the logic that people are using is just, is just incredible. The fact that it's natural. And by the way, at least poison ivy really hasn't been genetically altered recently. I mean, if you want to talk about another part, you know, what we're talking about a substance um, that has been at least selectively bred to increase the part that gets you high, the part that binds to all those receptors in the brain. I'm going to show you in a minute and decrease the parts that don't get you high. That's the issue that we're talking about. I'm gonna skip through a couple of slides. Um, so we're talking about, you know, here, here's the brain, right? We're talking about how cannabis and this, and THC is the active ingredient, okay? THC is what they're breeding up. That's what they're making to be, because that's what gets you high. It's, you know, remember, cannabis is a very complex plant, has over 500 components in it, Scientists really don't know, a th the, you know anything about the majority of what's in it. But we do know about some of the sub components. One of them is THC. THC is what gets you high. And THC binds to these receptors in the brain that are critical for really for everyday tasks. And this is why it is so ironic to me, because I know you've made a lot of progress on tobacco, right? <laughs> tobacco smoking has gone down. And it's good. You have tobacco-free workplace. These are very important. We do the same in the States. What I can't understand, though, is on the one hand, we're slamming the door on tobacco, right? And on the other hand, we're opening the back door on cannabis. I mean, I don't understand that logic, especially when you look at the effects of cannabis on the brain versus tobacco. Well, let's be very clear. You know, tobacco is the most, you know, nicotine is the most addictive drug known to man. I'm not here to say that it isn't. It's more, actually, it, by percentages, it's more addictive than heroin. Let's be very clear. But when you look at other things, so it's not just addictiveness we're worried about. We're also worried about your motivation. We're worried about this, the, the, the things that you need to succeed in school, right? We're worried about the things you need, you know, we're worried about your concentration. We're worried about your driving, you know, your motor skills, your reaction time, your reflexes. Those are also an important part of, you know, of daily life. And actually, when you look at tobacco, it doesn't really affect those other parts of the brain. It's, it's, it's amazing. It affects really very strongly your reward center, that's why it's addictive, and memory, 
right here. Yeah, remember, addiction, we, let's be very sort of candid about what addiction is. We don't need a fancy definition. Addiction means that you did something, your, your brain loved it, it remembered it loved it, and it wants to do it again despite the consequences. That's it. And so obviously with tobacco and with cigarettes, it's hugely powerful, as I said, we think even more powerful to that, those receptors in that part of the brain of memory and reward, even more than heroin, okay. But it doesn't affect those other parts of the brain. So to me, the drug that actually is much more linked to mental illness, much more linked to car crashes, much more linked to dropping out of school, tuning out, not being motivated, not concentrating, that's the drug that we're rolling out the red carpet for while we shut the door on the drug that really does affect others' secondhand smoke, but really affects health harms the most. In other words, there's no such thing as a tobacco-related car crash. There's really no such thing as a tobacco-related crime. There's really no such thing as a tobacco-related dropout of sc from school. Doesn't mean that we want people to use tobacco, don't get me wrong. But I, I never even say this when I'm in front of school kids because you know, they're, gonna, they're not gonna, they oftentimes won't understand that distinction and think that I'm sanctioning tobacco. Of course I'm not. What I'm saying is, Two wrongs don't make a right, and it doesn't make sense that we sort of say we are so adamantly against tobacco while at the same time we want to introduce cannabis. As you all know, the, the brain is in rapid development from, you know, really age zero to about, you know, depending, you know, different genders, 26, 28, 30, roughly 25 to 30. It's changing, which is a beautiful thing. I mean, thank God it is. It's amazing. Your brain is a sponge as a child, and that's why you learn a second, you know, have you ever seen a four-year-old learn how to ride a bike for the first time or versus a 50-year-old learning for the first time, right? Have you seen a, how about learning how to swim, right? Or learning a second language, right? Obviously, the four-year-old has a leg up. It's amazing, because it's sort of counterintuitive, right? Because you would think, well, as an adult, you can understand, you need to concentrate, you should do, you'd think the, you know, the kid's gonna be everywhere, you'd think that the adult would be better at learning a second language. Actually, it's not. It's, it's the child, right? And it's, that's a wonderful thing. Your brain is absorbing all of these things as it's growing. The flip side of that is it's also more, that means it's more vulnerable to bad things, right? It's more vulnerable to good things, it's more vulnerable to bad things. It means that childhood trauma and child abuse, frankly, are a more important social ill than adult trauma and abuse because this is something that could stay with the child for a very, very long time. Drugs are the same thing. You know, you, do, does anybody know someone who is a heroin, cannabis, or cocaine addict that started using drugs for the first time after age 25? Never touched it before, right? It's very hard to think of someone, and there will be the odd person here and there. But my point is, this is, if we're talking about it as a disease, I like to talk about it as a bio-behavioral disorder because it's biological, it's also behavioral. It's not the same thing as diabetes, but it does share a lot of the, from the health issues. So it's, a, it's, it's complex, it's not so black and white. Bio-behavioral disorder, this is a child, this is a pediatric onset illness, right? It's onset when you're young because that's when your brain is most vulnerable. Um, someone, you know, Bob DuPont, one of my mentors, wrote a book called The Selfish Brain 40 years ago. That's the best way I've ever heard it. Your brain is selfish. It loves to do things that you often think that you know you shouldn't do. Like when I'm grabbing that second piece of cake, I know, that I sit, my wife's like, you really shouldn't be doing this. And I'm like, well, you know, you, you, know, you, need, you, need, to, you, know, you need to go running after this if you do this, and it's just shouldn't do it, don't do it, don't do it. My brain is like, but remember how good it tastes. <laughs> Do it, right? It's the same thing for, for, for drugs of abuse. And by the way, these are all the same thing. These pleasure rewards in the brain. Unfortunately, food, sex, and things are necessarily for survival, right? We can't survive as a human race without it. Our brain is primed to love the pleasure from those things, from accomplishing something, from exercising, food, sex, like I said. But unfortunately, with what drugs of abuse do is that they take that pleasure in such an unnatural, off-the-chart way, right, way more than, you know, the best food or the best whatever other activity you're doing. And um, that's natural. And that's part of the problem, is that the brain gets used to that and it gets very selfish and wants that. And so the piece of chocolate cake is not going to substitute for the hit of crack, let me tell you, because the levels of pleasure are totally different. So this is part of the issue, is that your brain is essentially, like I like to say, under construction. 
until age 30, right? So it's vulnerable. That also means it's an, ex you know, when you're home, when you're flat, it's under construction, it's an exciting time. You know, my, we, we can pick the tile, we can pick the paint on the wall, we're forming the house, it's wonderful. The bad side is, like I'm from California originally, if there's an earthquake when it's under construction, you know, you're doomed, right? If there's some big thing that happens, uh, the house isn't gonna be able to be stable like the house next door that's already been built for uh, 50 years. 50 years is old where I come from in California, a 50-year-old house. I know it's different here. Um, but you know that's, that's my point. So your brain is under construction. And so we need to think about what are the best policies to frankly protect the brain. You know, someone once said, it's not a war on drugs, Kevin, because I hate that term war. It's a t stupid term. It doesn't mean anything. But it's not a war on drugs. It's a defense of our brains. I think that's true, right? Um, now, when we look at the evidence on cannabis, there's a huge, you know, uh, 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 debate, I guess, about the harmfulness and the addictiveness, which is, you know, really unfortunate. I, it, it was good to hear. I think there's maybe less of a debate here because people are actually reading and absorbing the research. Well, I'll tell you in the States, there's a, that our industry that we now have to deal with because it's legalized in two, in now in four states, um, is just, you know, they're the ones going onto Google to make sure that when a kid types in marijuana addictiveness, they get their website, right? They don't get the website of the National Institutes of Health, right? So the, the, the misinformation is huge. But the data we have, which frankly isn't even great data, and I'd love to hear from Catherine or others about if you have better data, but sadly, this is 20 years old. It's scary enough, though. One in six 16-year-olds who try cannabis for the first time for the first time, one in six will at some point in their life become addicted. Now people say, Kevin, it's a different kind of addiction, right? It's psychological, they say. Have you heard that before? Yeah, we've heard that. It's psychological. Your brain could care less if something is psychological or, there's no such thing as psychological addiction. Let me just say, there's, there's no such thing as physical addiction. Addiction is addiction. Your brain did something, it loved it. It wants to do it again, period. Now there are psychological or physical symptoms of that disorder, so you have some drugs that produce very violent shakes, as you, you know, or some kind of foaming at the mouth. Um, you know, marijuana. In terms, of, I, what I didn't say when you look at where in the brain that it affects, one place it does not affect is the stem right here. And the re, and, and what what does that mean? It means that you actually don't die from a respiratory overdose, heart stopping from cannabis. Which this is what young people love to say: you can't die from cannabis. They say, right? You've heard that before. You can die from alcohol. Alcohol does affect that part. Heroin obviously does, right? Other drugs do. Cannabis doesn't, does not have many receptors of THC. That when you inject the THC, it's not going to that part of your brain. I can't point to it because it's in my head. Um, but, uh, 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 and, and so people say, well, you know, that, that then therefore you can't die from it. Well, tobacco doesn't affect that part either. Would you ever say that tobacco doesn't kill anyone? Can you imagine someone saying that? Cigarettes don't kill. Well, they don't produce a fatal overdose. Have you ever heard of somebody smoking about, you know, 10,000 cigarettes at a sitting and dying of an overdose and not breathing? No, you can't. Tobacco doesn't affect that part of the uh, brain either. Well, but it kills in the US 500,000 people a year from lung cancer and respiratory problems indirectly. Well, what does cannabis do on suicide? What does it do on car crashes? What does it do for other accidents like literally the kid who, uh, the 19-year-old exchange student from Africa who came to Colorado to try cannabis because it was legal. Now, of course, he wasn't supposed to get it. He was supposed to be 21, but he was 19. Of course, he got it anyway, right? Same thing with alcohol. We know people who get it underage. Most people do. And he took, he ate a, one of these candy bars that they said, well, it's just a marijuana candy bar. How bad can it be? It has chocolate in it, you know? Everything with chocolate's good, right? How, even if it has cannabis in it. Well, Unfortunately, it wasn't funny for him. He ate the candy bar, had the hallucinations, thought that the walls were attacking him, the lights were attacking him. His friends didn't know what to do, and he ended up jumping off the building and dying. Now, of course, the industry said, oh, no, that wasn't the cannabis that did that. No, no, no. He, just, that was, he, he died from a head trauma. Well, that's true. He did die from the head trauma, but the head trauma was there because of his cannabis ingestion. It wouldn't, he wouldn't have jumped off of the fourth floor uh, building. So the same th that's an indirect death, right? Or, or, and so it's the same thing with, with tobacco, but we, we would never question tobacco's relation to death. We shouldn't question cannabis either, even if it doesn't produce the you know, respiratory sort of heart fail failure as we do the other thing. This is obviously, you know, th this is in, in the US, but it's very similar, I know, here uh, with the increase in the THC. And so when people talk about well, the 60s and 70s, 
it's just a different drug, folks. And what's, un what's incredible is when you hear people say, you know, it's just a plant. Um, not many people, I bet, know that this is drug as cannabis, the, of the pictures I'm showing. Not many people would think that the brown sticky substance on the far upper right on the end of a needle, right? That looks like another substance in my book, right? Doesn't look like cannabis. Well, the point is, you know, in our, in our, in our um, in, you know, wonders of innovation, I guess, we have learned how to extract the oils and the, well, using a butane process to get what they call, um, you can call it hash oil, butane hash oil, wax. There are a lot of slang words for it. I'd love to hear from you all if this is something you're seeing or not yet. But this is something vaporized. It's something that has nine, some of them have 98% THC potency. Now, remember, the data I showed you on addictiveness, that was 8% THC. <laughs> the data on IQ, which I'm gonna show you in a minute, it's probably 9% THC or less. I, we don't even know, but it was older data, so it can't be oh, higher than 10%. This is 98% THC. We have no clue what the effects are gonna be on this. And we're simply t wanting to take this gamble and saying that, you know, well, it's not that big of a deal. Um, sorry, when you look at things like high school completion, university entrance scores, I'm not gonna go through all the, the, the numbers here, but suffice to say, I mean, let's just, I mean, forget about the science for a minute. It, it's pretty self-explanatory. I mean, think about the guy that's using cannabis every single day. Is he getting this, the perfect grades in school and arriving on time? I mean, this is a drug that, that saps motivation for a lot of people. So it's not surprising when you see the university entrance scores, high school completion, um, all kinds of things like uh, free, um, correlating with suicide, dependence. You know, people say, well, it's not a gateway drug. You know, I don't really like the term gateway because again, it's sort of begun to mean nothing. It's not a scientific controversy that cannabis, that 98% that, that, that of people who use heroin or cocaine or other substances did use cannabis before they, they used that. That's not a controversy, okay? It's also not a controversy to say that most people who use cannabis don't use heroin or cocaine, right? So it's sort of, you have to look at it both ways. But the point is, why is there that connection for some people? That's the interesting question. Not, is it a gateway drug? That's a, that's a, that's a shallow question. The question is, why, for some people, is there a connection? And, and of course, you know, uh, there's data that's looking at this, but some of the early data is showing that essentially you're, you're, you are, um, you're, you're, you're priming your brain for addictions when you begin at a young age, even with cannabis or alcohol. In other words, your brain is getting used to getting high on that scale we were talking about, you know, food, sex, natural, unnatural is illegal drugs. Your brain is, is, is getting, it, and it wants a bigger high. It does, it's sort of cannabis is like, well, I wanna try something else now. Now, of course, I think for a lot of people, for everyone, there are gonna be different reasons why you go on, but it is interesting research we're beginning to look at. You know, car crashes, it's a huge issue, and I have to, you know, it's amazing that we even have to talk about it. But we do, because when I go speak to young people, and I don't know how it is here, maybe your young people are, I think they are smarter than, our, than ours, but when I speak to ours, they say to me, Kevin, cannabis makes me a better driver. Not worth. And I said, really, why is, again, you have to engage. Why is that, right? Well, because I'm going 35 in a 65 zone. It's like, well, wait a minute. That's a, as dangerous as going 90 in a 65 zone when you go 35, right? And, you know, you're missing, the, the light has just turned red and your brain processed that three seconds after you're through the intersection. Right? You have to make a quick left over here, not in the other one because it's a one-way road. And you miss that. You're five seconds later, you realize what you're doing because the reaction time is huge and the reflexes. And that's a big deal. You know, when you're driving, it's amazing the complex tasks your brain is performing that you, we don't think about because we're just doing it. But your brain is like processing the light here, the person crossing the street, the guy who's stopping. I gotta turn left over here. I have to remember, my, use my memory, that I need to turn right over there. I also have to remember that there's gonna be traffic there. So I have to, your, your brain is doing 100 things at once. And when you're on, under the influence of cannabis, obviously we shouldn't be surprised that the British Medical Journal said that it doubles your risk of a car crash. That's probably an, a low number, but we'll go with it. It's, it's bad enough. And by the way, when you use alcohol, along with cannabis. And I think when the ministers talk about poly drug use, that's very good because we sometimes have this idea that stuff is just used in a vacuum. 
and we just think of like, what are the cannabis uses? What are they, wh who's using alcohol? Who's Folks, this is, these are the same people, right? They're filling a void in their life. One person's void they're filling is called alcohol. The other one's because cannabis. Most of them are both of them. So we have to remember that you all know that more than anybody. But when you add alcohol to driving with cannabis, it is four times worse than alcohol alone. Okay. So there's an additive effect, which is, um, now some people, you know, some of the legalization folks, they say, well, no, no, it, they kind of cancel each other out. <laughs> you know, you use alcohol and you're like angry, you use cannabis, it kind of brings you down. So yeah, that makes sense. This is the scientific, I guess we have to learn this kind of scientific reasoning, Professor. Now they sort of cancel each other out. Well, no, they don't. They, all the data shows that it's additive, and, and that's a real issue. Now, I want to sort of just um, talk about an issue that is not yet, uh, I don't think is really here in Ireland. I mean, I, I sort of hear about it here and there when I was doing research, but I think it's a good lesson. Um, and I, I would, so I sort of do this as a warning, kind of. <laughs> you know, the old stereotype for the cannabis user, right? The guy who's living at home with mom, you know, in the basement, uh, going from job to job, sort of minimum way, not, not really doing much in his life, not really having lofty goals. The cannabis movement in the United States and the world about 30 years ago had an image problem. This was their image problem. The, the cannabis guy was this guy. Nobody, do you think any minister would wanna say that I want to make it easier for this person to smoke cannabis? No. Okay, it was an image problem. They said to themselves, gosh, how do we change the minds of ordinary citizens who don't use cannabis? Remember, over 93% in this country didn't use cannabis in the last month. In the US, it's still it's about 91%, very similar. 92% didn't use it in the last month. Okay. How do we make it so that 90% of people who don't use cannabis think this is an okay thing to do? And they came up with a brilliant, 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 brilliant strategy. I'm sure they're gonna be implementing it here soon if they haven't already. They said, we have to change the stereotype from this person to this person, right? Granny, is that what you call her here, a granny? Granny. <laughs> Who's gonna vote against granny, first of all? And I've seen Irish grannies, let me tell you, you're never gonna vote against any Irish granny. <laughs> Okay, I've seen some of them. And when Granny says, or when at least you can find one, I mean, you only need to find one. You think you, need, you don't need to find a thousand, you need to find one. You bring one down into Parliament, wherever you're bringing them down to, doig, and they say, Granny needs her cannabis. Does anybody want to vote against Granny? Let me tell you, that minister and no one else, we're not voting against Granny. And it's brilliant because you change the conversation. This is rhetoric 101. You don't answer the question that the person's asking you. <laughs> you. You come up with your own question and answer, right? No matter the question. And you say, I'm not gonna talk about the harmfulness of cannabis. That's, we're gonna lose that debate, so I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm gonna shift it and say, basically, how can something be bad for you if it's good for you? That's the reasoning. How can something be bad for you that's good for you? And if you can make cannabis look good for you, you never have to talk about how it's bad for you. And um, this was brilliant, and they even had conferences where they said quotes like this, the head of normal in, in the United States, in 1979, we will use medical marijuana, right, as a red herring to give marijuana a good name. I mean, they were, they were out and proud. <laughs> they didn't even try and hide it. And so what they did was they, I mean, it's amazing. They basically said, we're, and, and people, some people thought they're never gonna succeed. I mean, medicines go through the scientific process. Politicians and the general public do not get to determine what the science is. It's just something we don't do. Thank God we don't do it. I mean, we're not, I'm not, I'm, I'm certainly not trained in, you know, biopharma, uh, psychopharmacological, uh, biopharmaceutical uh, development. I mean, that's, a, that's for the laboratory, okay. But they were able to basically say the radical thing of we're gonna, we're gonna change this thing. And they did by bringing out Granny and saying, this helps her. Who are you to tell her this doesn't help her? Now, of course, let's say some of this uh, font didn't transfer. The reality is it's a more of a nuanced issue again. And again, this doesn't fit on a bumper sticker, so maybe that's why we lost this in the States. But the answer is no, yes, and maybe all at once. On the one hand, cannabis is not medicine. You don't smoke any medicine, right? On the other hand, there are medications based on the cannabis plant 
that have proven to have some medical value. And that's, I mean, and that's not a big deal, folks. We, we have medications based on opium. <laughs> our, our best painkiller, morphine, the most used painkiller in the world that has saved hundreds of millions of lives, comes from the same plant that heroin does, right? That's, and, but we've made that distinction in society, which is healthy. That's good that we have, I think. But can you imagine if we said, legalize heroin because morphine works? Right? And that's what they're doing. They're confusing the components in this complex plant that I told you about, cannabis, with let's just smoke the leaf and the burning leaves and we'll be fine. Now, of course, the more interesting part is the maybe, which is even more nuanced for politics, which is even more a harder sell, which is that additional research is needed and there's a lot of exciting research done on the different components of cannabis, especially the components that don't get you high. And remember I showed you the slide of THC. I also showed you, as you, and here we can bring it back to it, um, the CBD, and I showed you that there's something called CBD, which is non-psychoactive ingredient. It stands for cannabidiol. It's just like THC, except it doesn't hit those parts in the brain. It doesn't get you high in that, in that way. We've actually found that CBD m might be helpful for some things, and I think that's great. Let's turn it into a medication, have it at a pharmacy. Uh, I believe you have Sativex uh, here. Yeah, we don't have it yet, um, but you're way ahead of us once again. <laughs> and what is Sativex? Well, Sativex is a mouth spray. I have a picture of it here, there it is, mm, right there, which is half THC and half CBD, more or less, <laughs> It doesn't get you high. And for a lot of people with uh, difficult multiple sclerosis, muscular issues, this can be helpful for them. And I think that's great. But that is so different than saying medical marijuana. And I say that as a warning because I think you're going to get this debate if you haven't already. You need to distinguish between medical components, or we call them cannabinoids, if you can remember that, and medical marijuana. The term medical marijuana is as inane as saying medical heroin. It doesn't mean it, it doesn't make sense. Medical opium, actually. Can you imagine? Medical opium poppy. No, we call it morphine, right? We need to make that distinction, uh, most definitely. And there are other things that are CBD based. This is one, comes from a um, you, uh, pharmaceutical company in England called GW Pharmaceuticals. But in the United States, we have confused these issues tremendously. We have not made that distinction, and that's why I'm warning you about it. So now, a third here, a third of our young people, where do they get their cannabis from? Someone else's medical marijuana recommendation, right? And guess who the average medical marijuana user in the US is? A 30-year-old white male with a little bit of back pain who went to the dispensary. I, I've seen the word dispensary here. We, don't, we only use that in the context of marijuana now in the U.S., so I see that you still use the term, which is great. And I took a picture of it. I said, this is what a dispensary should look like. I saw one here down the street. It said dispensary, but it wasn't selling cannabis, thank God. But in the U.S., we have dispensaries, and they serve medical marijuana dispensaries, they're called. There's no physician. There's no one there with medical, any medical background. There's, if you're on Venice Beach in Los Angeles, there's a girl with a bikini saying, come get your medical cannabis. And I see some of you guys taking notes when I said that, but it's not medically oriented at all. And we shouldn't be surprised <laughs> that it's not people with cancer and AIDS. You know what, if you have cancer or AIDS and you wanna use you know, heroin, knock yourself out. I'm not, this isn't about someone with a terminal illness. These are about people with a headache or a made-up disease. I'm not even making this up. One person went in, uh, an, undercover DE, an undercover drug agent went into one of these things, and he said, I am stressed out because my dog is sick. And in five seconds, with $200 cash, he got a green card that said he was a sick patient in need of marijuana. So I hope you can all learn from the complete joke, which is what, the, which is what it is. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Colorado because I want you to learn that Colorado did not legalize cannabis overnight. It started with decriminalization. It started with, and then, and then also with medical. And people said, oh, no, no, this isn't about legalization. This is about, you know, decriminalization. We need to change our priorities of police, et cetera, et cetera. Well, 
Um, anyway, uh, of course, we believe it or not, despite the myth, this is, this is the third myth in my book, in the US, we do not imprison people who smoke marijuana. And I just have to say that because everyone around the world thinks that we do. We have an embarrassingly high incarceration rate that I'm not proud of that we need to reduce. For a, but we have that incarceration rate for a lot of reasons. And uh, it's very interesting, um, in the Democratic debate for president two nights ago, one of the nominees unfortunately said, yes, I would probably, he said, I, he, said I su he didn't really answer the question really, but he said, I suppose I would vote for legalization because people, we need to, we need to lower the burden of our prison population. And then um, we have this thing called PolitiFact. I don't know if you have something similar, that rate, that is a nonpartisan fact-based source that rates politicians' one-liners. <laughs> it's a real good way to keep, try and keep politicians honest. And PolitiFact, rated that one-liner as just yesterday, I just tweeted it, as mostly false to say that our prisons are, which was great that they did that. We were, we were surprised that they even took the issue on. We were very happy that they did. Um, so there is that huge myth out there. But anyway, that's how they get it for, right? They say, well, these people are not, and then I've looked, by the way, I've looked at the statistics in Ireland, right? I've seen that it's something like 136 people out of 13,600 or so, 130, anyway. 1% of people in, behind bars for cannabis possession. Now, I also would ask another question, which I don't think there are the statistics of. What is the average amount of cannabis the person had in there? Because I don't even think those 136 people were just had a you know, spliff in their pocket, right? I have a feeling that they had, it was more than that, or they were pled down from uh, low-level selling or something like that. But even if they weren't, 1%, folks. So I'm happy to have a conversation about, and as I did with the minister, about let's not give a kid a criminal record for a joint. I'm happy to have that conversation. But let's not pretend that our jails and all the you know, law enforcement are focusing on people with cannabis and that's why we should change the law. Because that's not the real reason. And in a state like Colorado, and that's why it's amazing when people like Richard Branson, by the way, talk about this issue. Because they say, we need to not give children a criminal record for cannabis. We should follow the Portuguese model, which I'm gonna talk about in a bit. We should do all this. Therefore, we should legalize. You know, they're confusing all of these issues together, but in reality, folks, this is about full legalization and it's not about cannabis at all. Cannabis has nothing to do with the conversation at all. It is about the legalization of all drugs because that's where you're gonna make the money. You're gonna make money from a leaf that anybody, any, any person with an IQ of 80 can grow in their backyard. You know how much easier it is to grow cannabis than it is to make alcohol, for example, let alone tobacco. This isn't in, in, a, in a drug that's so low labor intensive like cannabis. This is about a drug that you can't do in your own backyard, like processing poppy and make heroin. This is about producing methamphetamine and cocaine. And so we have to look at the end game. And in Colorado, we have an end game. The, fir the first part of the end game is, the, is cannabis. It's gonna go to other things. But they started in 2001 with allowing medical cannabis, they said. And then they did decriminalization. And then they opened their first stores. And I don't know, how, has, has anybody in this audience been to Colorado recently? No. Well, here, I'll save you the trip and the, and the, um, the cost. Say so you're, you're getting a good deal with the registration because we're going to go on a tour of Colorado a little bit. And you're going to go into a cannabis store and you're going to see this. Now, I know you think that I, maybe I messed up the slide because this is the candy store. Right? Maybe I forgot. Maybe I Googled the wrong thing or I save image. You know, you, sometimes you save the wrong image. It can be very embarrassing. This, is not, this isn't the wrong image, it's the right image. And um, this has nothing to do with a joint in, some, in a little joint that someone is holding and smoking now and again, nothing. This has everything to do with kid and child-friendly products. Now let me tell you something. I know that you're all shaking your head, and I, and I know, and I'll give the benefit of the doubt, that if the minister was here, he'd be shaking his head as vehemently as you. But let me also tell you that 10 years ago in Colorado, they were shaking their head when they saw what was California was doing and they, had, they said, we all will never have that. Oh, that's terrible. And then they got tricked into voting for this because tax revenue for schools, getting rid of the drug dealers. That's what they said. We'll get rid of the drug dealers and we'll fund your schools. Right, like the drug dealers were gonna say, all right, you've legalized cannabis. We're gonna go become teachers now, we're done. Has anybody ever studied the underground drug market who's ever said that? I mean, it's amazing, right? Or as if the schools, right, because we've had the lottery and alcohol and tobacco, we've been waiting for the school money, that finally the school money was gonna come in because of cannabis, right? 
But but unfortunately, sadly, I guess we're a bit of a vulnerable lot. We agree. We, agree. we, we voted for it in Colorado. But we didn't know that we were voting for this, right? People weren't thinking about this. They weren't thinking about, I think you call them jelly babies. I like that term better than gummy bears. They weren't thinking about jelly babies of cannabis. They weren't thinking about, you know, um, all the different kinds of chocolate bars and candies and brownies and lollipops, et cetera, et cetera, of cannabis. And let me tell you, this is the majority of the cannabis sold legally. These are edibles. These are the majority of them are edibles. And what we're now seeing in, now, by the way, you might be thinking, boy, that looks like a good, that they really uh, imitated the Jelly Baby or what we call gummy bear. They really did it in a, in a very accurate way. Yes, they did because they bought it from the same supplier that supplies major candy manufacturers, except they did one thing. When they bought it, they put out it all on a table and they infused it with cannabis. So it doesn't even look different. There's no, it looks, it is the exact same candy, but you don't know it has cannabis in it until you've eaten it. And it kind of seems funny and like, oh, well, you know, it's really kind of a, the reality is you eat one or two of these things and you're a seven-year-old, which is what's happening, you're going to the emergency room for three days in Colorado at Children's Hospital because you have a seven-year-old brain and you've now just ingested 10 milligrams of THC. And when we've had, when we've, you know, we said, well, you can, this is, you know, now it's a legitimate industry, Kevin. It's not drug dealers. So you can reason with them and put laws, you know, and, and regulate it. We haven't done that one bit. Why? Because they're a special interest lobbying group. They refuse to, to uh, budge on anything. They have the money, and they're up against people like you. They're up against social workers. And, you know, I've got to tell you, also in the U.S., social, you know, it's not, it's not exactly, you don't exactly get paid a handsome profit for the work you do. You don't exactly have, how many lobbyists do you have here? You have hundreds of lobbyists? Just like, no, you don't. Neither do they in the States. So they're, they're you, they're just American. And they're going up against these guys in suits with the Ivy League education. And let me tell you, they don't stand a chance. I hate to say it, because you're not trained in politics. Your day job isn't to hang around the legislature. Your day job is to save lives. So now you're trying to save lives and deal with public policy? That's no fair, because you're now going up against these guys with the slick hair and the, and the vocabulary and the suits. And you don't stand a chance. I hate to say it. No offense. And in America, they're not standing a chance either. And so if I have to hear from anybody that we can regulate this in a way, these are special interest groups that are highly influential into our politicians. And when we said to them, all right, have some decency. Put a plain package. You know, you want to produce a grape kiwi-flavored gummy bear? At least cover it up in plain packaging. At least put a warning that you can read. You know, they put these warnings, it's like in Times.5 font. I mean, a, an adult couldn't read it, let alone a, a 10-year-old. Do something that, you know, or how about don't sell, I know this sounds radical, don't sell a jelly baby with cannabis in it. Just stick to your joints, at least. The answer is no way. And so if I have to hear from people that we can do this responsibly, I'm waiting for that to happen. I've never seen it happen with alcohol. I've never seen a responsible industry with tobacco until we you know, finally force them to stop advertising. But I'm certainly not seeing a responsible industry here with, uh, with cannabis. And they're taking things that are known. And we laugh, and it's funny, but you know, again, an eight-year-old isn't going to be able to see that G there and realize that that's different, right? And, and realize that the ring pots and the pot tarts and the sodas and the, you know, Mr. Green Buds and all those things are different from the actual candy. And the father who wants to open the newspaper on a Saturday but can't do it in front of the 10-year-old because he's afraid he's going to open it up and see a joint with a smiley face on it. I mean, this is, these are real stories. This is real. And by the way, people think this is often like fake. and This is real. You can buy any of these if you go to Colorado. Um, we were told they won't advertise. Well, unfortunately, in the, in, you know, for, for better or worse, you know, our, uh, when uh, our founding fathers decided to, to break away from the British, the first thing that was important to us was freedom of speech and expression. And that's very important to us in America, freedom of speech and expression. The problem is there's a little flip side to that is it has been twisted to be interpreted as any corporation can say whatever the hell they want, even if it's against the interest of public health. I hate to just put it that way. But that is what, what unfortunately happens. What does that mean? You're, trying to, you're wondering what I'm getting at? I'm getting at the advertising. 
that we cannot regulate or control until we have a constitutional convention. <laughs> and so when you say free dab, now the parent driving down the freeway has no idea what that is, by the way. <laughs> this isn't for the, they said this was for the responsible adults. No, it's not. No responsible adult knows what that is. It's for the 15 year old who knows that he's gonna get his brother, who's 18, to go in there and get whatever they need to get and get some free dabs on his way out and give it to the 15 year old younger brother. That's what it means. And the widespread advertising, and by the way, exploitation of women, just like the alcohol industry, because your primary target is the 21 year old boy, right? That's the target here. Yeah, so no, so the dabbing, I'll remind you, is that wax thing that I showed you before, the brown uh, thing that basically it, beco you know, it becomes this, they call it shatter or dab, it becomes like this very hard material, this wax material, and then you can put it on, the, on a needle, hot, make it hot, vaporize it, and ingest it, and you're ingesting 98% THC. It's not something that's actually ingested, it's not injected like a needle, no, it's not injected, but it, it's a vaporized. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to show you, know, I, I can show you here the statistics, you can read the stats online, we'll show you the report that we did, but I want you to see what's not exactly in the reports. I want you to see the, the coupons, the advertising, the kinds of things that are going on, because folks, this is the discussion that started 15 years ago with decriminalization. Here's where we are now. Um, th this is what I'm worried about. So we are seeing, and I will show you some of the stats, we are showing an increase in use in Washington and Colorado after legalization. We don't have a lot of research, but we know that it's higher than and rising faster than the national average among all age groups. We also have, and I'm gonna leave all this data with you, you don't have to take all the notes, it's a lot of numbers, but we also have the accidental ingestion by children. The, this is the, you know, this is the, the younger sister whose older sibling's boyfriend spent the night and left a gummy bear or a candy bar on the counter and you grab it and eat it. I mean, it's, it's not that out, you know, it's pretty, you can imagine it happening and it's, happen, it's happening a lot. We don't have a lot of data though. We don't, we don't, we're only, we're having to, you know, you can imagine the, the state authorities, frankly, they don't want to put a lot of data on this. <laughs> It'll reveal what a farce this whole thing is. And so we have to go to little hospitals here and there and basically beg for data. And that's, this is why when, some, when somebody says we want to do an experiment, that's what they said about Colorado. This is an experiment. Well, as the good scientists and others will know, and the professors here, an experiment means you're actually looking at data, <laughs> right? An experiment means you have a scientific hypothesis and you're following the scientific method and you're looking at numbers. Folks, we're not looking at any numbers. The state authorities are not looking at any numbers. So when I hear this is just an experiment, it's not an experiment. <laughs> This is something that we're implementing that our young people are having to deal with. In Washington State, you know, we talk a lot about Colorado, but in Washington State, poisonings are also up. Calls to our poison center. They said it would reduce the costs if you legalize. Folks, they have to hire more people to man the phones at the poison centers. Colorado has spent $22 million regulating marijuana because they've had to create a whole new bureaucracy in government. So, you know, you hear like, well, we'll be able to save money. It's not actually saving money. Even arrests are up in cities that have higher rates of marijuana. Why? You might think, how are they arresting people? It's legal. <laughs> it's not technically legal if you're a teenager. I don't know what the numbers are here, but in the U.S., our number one drug responsible for arrests, do you know what that drug is? Alcohol. <laughs> a legal drug. Public intoxication driving while intoxicated, and selling to minors. Double the number of people arrested in the U.S. for those things than crack, cocaine, heroin, cannabis, benzos, psychoactive, and whatever combined. And so be why? Because more people are doing it, more people are then uh, are, are, are vulnerable to having problems with it. Teen admissions to drug treatment are up, um, way up, and a huge thing in Washington State, a very significant increase in those testing positive for marijuana and driving. Um, on, oh, this is a huge, I'm not gonna have time to talk about this, but on the job marijuana use. If you're a business person, if you're an insurance company, if you're, the landscape has changed. 
Because here is a drug that stays in your system longer, and we could go through some of the research, but we don't have time. You know, as you know, cannabis does stay in your blood and your systems longer. It doesn't mean that it's just detected longer. It means that you're actually impaired longer, longer than you think you are. So when we do studies of people who have smoked a lot of cannabis, let's say the day before, or the two days before, who do not appear high, right? The high has worn out. When they do studies on driving, concentration, memory thing, they're impaired. And we, we don't think of it like that because we think it's like alcohol. It's not. Alcohol is in and out of your system. Alcohol does not absorb in the fat. Alcohol. So cannabis is in your fat cells, not alcohol. Alcohol is out of your system in 24 hours. Flushes through. Cannabis doesn't. It's lipid, fats. And so there's incredible research coming from Marilyn Eustis, who leads an intramural research program in the United States, but she travels around the world working with scientists really in ev everywhere around the world on this. It's incredible how, you know, in terms of it staying in your system. But the effect that that's having on the workplace, on the job, listen, you're at a factory working with someone who's high and they make a mistake, then they say, oh, no, no, it wasn't my fault. I wasn't, you know, I used cannabis two days ago. It has nothing to do with me. It's because of faulty machinery or it's this, my coworker's fault. These are the real things that are happening now that it's legal. Um, and then you say, well, how are these succeeding in the different states? The simple answer is you have to follow the money. And I will say one thing, though, that I think is really important and is a bit of good news. People are having second thoughts in Colorado. You know, the, 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 the mom, we call them soccer moms, the voting block of, um, you, know, you know, mothers who, um, you know, have kids and are driving around in the minivan, and, uh, or soccer dads, we call them that, too. The soccer moms and dads voted for this because they thought their schools were going to be funded and they were going to get rid of the drug dealers, okay? Now that they're saying that that's not happening, because if you're a drug dealer, by the way, it's never been a better time to be in Colorado. Let me just give you that hint. Don't tell your clients that. Um, but sir, no, seriously, it's never been a better time. Go to Colorado if you're a drug dealer. Demand is off the charts. Homeless people are, um, homeless youth are in droves moving to Colorado thinking they're going to get pot everywhere. And so there's huge demand that the legal market can't uh, meet. The legal market is taxing marijuana, making it expensive for a lot of people. The black market is right there to be there to undercut the tax. We have a big problem with that with tobacco. I don't know if you do. We have a huge underground market for tobacco no one likes to talk about. I think you do too. And so we have an underground market for cannabis. Anyway, what are people doing? They're voting to ban stores. Communities are now coming together and saying, you know what, mm, this isn't what we signed up for. We, we don't actually... You know, we, we, we don't want someone to go to prison for smoking a joint, but we don't want to sell pot gummy bears and candy bars and our, next to the ice cream store that I take my kids to on the weekends, right? So they're actually voting to ban them. 84% in the last election, 66%, two-thirds of local cities, towns, villages, counties have completely banned the sales of cannabis in Colorado. People don't talk about that. So we think there is a growing backlash. Now... I want to spend a few minutes at the end here um, with what about decriminalization? So I'm sort of moving backwards now after I showed you where, you know, sometimes you want to read a story, you read the end first, <laughs> and then you say, how did we get there? That, that's sort of what, what I wanted to do. How did we get there? First of all, I think it is a very poorly understood term. I said that in the beginning. Um, I think it's way too broad a term. What do you mean decriminalization? Do you mean use, possession, selling? Public, private, youth, not youth, cannabis, other drugs. Those are nine things that just came. But there are probably 30 qu other questions. So when people talk about this, what are they talking about? I think that if you remove all sanctions for drug use and there is zero accountability, zero follow-up, I don't think that's in the spirit of a pro-health policy. I just, again, if you have diabetes, I want you to come and get help. Right? And if you're committing crimes because you're not getting help, which doesn't happen if you have diabetes, but absolutely happens if you have drug addiction, that's a problem. And we have to deal with it in society. And so, you know, I was talking about, I know you have the one drugs court here in Dublin. Why are you then thinking about Portugal? <laughs> Portugal's far away. I mean, what, right here in your neighborhood, you have a model that could work. Now, is it a perfect model? Can it be adapted? It should be adapted, absolutely. And when I talk about it with a minister and other people, they say, well, Kevin, you know, I, went to the, I go to the drugs court. I've seen it. And the people are just sick there. They just need, they actually, you need health. They don't need a court at all. 
But wait a minute. The person who's in the drugs court, the person who's getting arrested, they're not just getting arrested because they used heroin or they used cannabis, right? They're getting arrested because usually they've committed a crime. They're doing something at the same time that their drug use is discovered. And so the person picked up by law enforcement isn't exactly the perfect angel shooting up heroin and not bothering anybody. They're usually committing some crimes or something going on, right? That, they're, that, that they're, they're in public or they're seen or whatever. There's something happening that they're being picked up by law enforcement. And if that happens, that is appropriate then for a drugs court. Be what is a drug court? You all know what it is. It's you combine therapeutic and legal. You say to the person, we know you committed that crime probably because you're addicted to drugs. So we don't want to just throw you in prison because you'll leave in a year and do it again. That doesn't help anybody. But we also don't want to say, eh, you know what, not a big deal. Um, if it happens again, though, we're really going to get you. If it happens again, uh, you know what, we're just going to increase the fine. Uh, if it happens again, though, you know, we're really going to. That's like telling your, <laughs> for those of you that have children, that's like telling your child, your 10 year or your 15 year old, <laughs> you know, Johnny, if you don't clean your room, there's a 50% chance that in six months, I'm going to ground you for a year. Can you imagine? Because that's what they say. They say, well, let's do, you know, wait till they, they offend 12 times and then, you know, really stick it to them if they do that. But, you know, in the, in the first 11 times, we don't want to do much. How is that deterring behavior? But if you told Johnny, you know what, if you don't clean your room right this minute, there's a 100% chance that you're not going to go to the movies tonight. Now, you're not going to ground them for a year. No one's saying they should have this punitive, they should be in jail forever. We're not saying that. But we're saying... Do something that's credible, and a drugs court keeps, frankly, those with substance use disorders accountable by saying, we're going to give you a chance to go to treatment. We, we love you. We want to help you. Your community cares about you. You've never heard that probably in your life, but your community cares about you, right? Right? And, but you also have accountability. It's, I think it's, 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 it goes with the Irish granny model, I think. It's like strong, loving, <laughs> right, but accountable. And it's, you, if you don't do that, though, there will be consequences. Because we can't just say that the fact that you were driving while you're high is no big deal, right? We can't just say that the car that you broke into of your neighbors because you needed money for drugs, we're going to let it go because you're sick. We can't just say that the lying and stealing that you're doing with your own family members and your own mother is no big deal. So we want to help you. Let us help you, and, and you help yourself by agreeing to go to treatment. You agree to go to treatment. You show that you're negative in terms of the drug testing that we will do. And sometimes we say we're going to drug test and we never do it. And then we've lost all accountability. But if you say you're going to do it, you do it. And if you show to be negative, you get your life on track, we don't want to throw you in jail and give you a criminal record. It's not what we want to do. We want to. But when you're out in the community and it happens again, You've messed up. You have to pay for it in some way. That is the kind of model we've actually seen work. And by the way, not only has it, is it working here in Dublin, it's working throughout Europe. I mean, again, we're so obsessed with Portugal. What about Belgium? Right? What about other countries that uh, uh, have drug courts that have actually worked? You know, I know we don't like to honestly look at the British model. I understand the sensitivities. But I know that in London, <laughs> uh, you know, they have a huge problem, obviously, as, as maybe you do too. But I know there they do, with public drinking and intoxication. And the problem, I mean, I'll tell you, when I was a student at Oxford and I would get, you know, the pubs would close at 11, I'd feel more unsafe there than in New York City at 2 in the morning when the clubs closed. And I'll tell you why. It's because there were these gangs of, they weren't gangs, they were, you know, Oxford, PPE, you know, prim and proper, wouldn't say a word during the day. And then you get a few drinks of them at night, and they're a totally different person. And if you made eye contact with one of them for more than two seconds, they wanted to come beat you up. Is that an unfamiliar scenario? Yeah, no, it's familiar, right. This is, this is what I felt when I lived for, there for four years. I seen the effects of a legal drug that's regulated alcohol and how that can affect a lot of people. And so, you know, in London, they had this huge problem. They implemented basically a court for um, repeated alcohol offenders similar to this. Basically, accountability. We're going to test you every day. If you don't drink and you stay out of crime, you're going to be okay. But if not, you're going to... And it's been hugely successful. I'm going there to observe it in a few days. But it's been hugely successful. We need, we, you, we need, and you have the Dublin Drug Court, but you need, you need to have more than that. Um, you know, we do have data on countries in, the, in Europe 
was, um, I would say, not so much legalized, but really there's de facto legalized countries like um, Spain uh, or, or, or even in Italy, and then countries that have decriminalized or said they have, and then countries that keep it illegal. There is a trend with use, and the trend is that the more lenient you get, the, more, the higher numbers of users you get. Um, absolutely, and we, this is why this is a complex issue, and I hate the term decriminalization, but even the way the law is structured makes a huge difference. If you're a decriminalized, we're just gonna you know, give you a fine and you go away, which is what a lot of people are proposing here, you have much higher rates of use than if you're maybe the more of the model I described, where you, you don't give the kid a criminal record, but you keep them accountable, you have treatment, early intervention, prevention, et cetera, not prevention anymore, but early intervention, treatment, counseling, accountability, recovery, you actually have lower use. And in a state like, I'll say in Massachusetts, they decriminalized in 2008. They said, nothing is working, you know, drug use was falling dramatically. They were saying, nothing works in drug, you know, drug policy is broken. Meanwhile, drug, drug use is going down, but they didn't pay attention to that. And they said, we need to decriminalize. And the way they decriminalized in Massachusetts was the worst way. And I used to live in Boston for five years. Basically, if you had an ounce or less, and by the way, people think an ounce is nothing, 300 grams, sorry, 30 grams. Uh, that's, that's about 50, that's, well, in the US, 30 grams is something like, could be 60 joints. I don't know what it is here, but it's not nothing, okay? Um, it's not, it probably doesn't fit in your pocket, all right? Anyway, an ounce or less, we said, well, we'll give you a $100 fine. There's no increase if you repeat. There's no requirement for education. There's no treatment. There's no, um, oh, even if you, the, the court ruled that if you have it in your, in your, in your glove compartment, in your, in your car, you know, on the passenger side, over here, yeah, um, that, uh, <laughs> that um, it, it, it wasn't, that didn't, that didn't mean anything. It was just like if you had it in your pocket. Okay. When they did that, drug use did go up in Massachusetts after that. And, you know, of course, now what do they want to do? They want to legalize. <laughs> they, you know, the, 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 the industry has come in and said we want to legalize. And everybody wants to look at Portugal. You're not so much looking at Massachusetts, I know. But you want to look at Portugal. And we've got to understand what Portugal did, okay? This is why when Richard Branson gets up there and says, we want to legalize, look at Portugal, it makes no sense. Portugal didn't legalize. Even their, I don't even think the term decriminalization proper, it, it's a, I don't think you have the word, you have the word in English, actually, what they did in Portuguese. It's a strange thing. But basically what they did is if you're arrested for a small amount of a drug, you supposedly, and I don't think it happens in every case, and that's a big problem, but you supposedly go in front of a panel of three people, social workers, lawyers, and they basically say, uh, you need treatment, you need a fine, you need nothing, etc. cetera. Um, at the same time that they did that, the dirty little secret no one likes to talk about has nothing to do with decriminalization. They increased drug treatment dramatically. They funded heroin treatment. They didn't open an injection room, by the way, but they opened a treatment facility rehabilitation. Okay, so they did that, and then they did their three-person panel thing. What's happened since 2001? The results are very mixed. Um, actually, if you look at many indications like cannabis and other rates of drug use, it's actually gone up. Now we hear it's gone way down, it's falling, it's a miracle. No. Uh, I don't know if it's gone up because of, the, because of what they did, but I'm just saying it has gone up. Okay. On the other hand, they have had a reduction in drug-related deaths, which I know is very important. I know here in Ireland, I think you're the third in Europe. It's not good. It's a badge of dishonor. We're number one in the world, don't worry. Um, we are three... <laughs> We are, you know, 300, uh, sorry, um, uh, over 100 people a day in the United States dying of an opiate overdose. Right? That's why we've implemented treatment, increased treatment in naloxone, et cetera. Anyway, they did have a reduction in use, but guess what? But we don't know. Was that from the treatment that they implemented, or was that from the three-person panel, or was that from just nothing, from something else we don't even know about? The bottom line is we don't know. And if you actually, what's amazing is you talk to people in Europe and the US who say, Portugal, and then you go to Portugal and you talk to their own officials, they're actually much more modest about it. <laughs> they're, they're not like, look at us as an example. They're like, well, you know, we did treatment, we did this. We're assessing it year by year. We have problems, we're working on it. You know, uh, we're a country of you know, three million people. We've sort of figured out that this might work for, we don't know. They're much more humble about it than I love the politicians who don't live in Portugal in the US and otherwise who are like, Portugal. So there are, my point is there's a lot of nuance here. 
they haven't had a robust success. And I would say, okay, you can look at Portugal, but what about, sorry, what about Belgium? Um, you know, what about Sweden, by the way, which has a robust drug policy? Now in Belgium, um, they were very skeptical of drugs, <laughs> drugs courts. You know, they said, oh my God, you know, the common law system, American legal culture, the last thing we need is another American import. You know? uh, it's like Americans tried to import you know, chocolate and it was a disaster. You know, Belgium was known for that. And uh, you know, now they want to import drugs policy, give me a break. And they were very skeptical. And they basically said, you know what though, we want to use the legal system to change behavior. We want to turn the paradigm of the way the legal system should work. And this is their own, these are their own words, by the way. I mean, this is, um, I'm, I just met with the drug court judge in Belgium and also the prosecutor, and, and they're over the moon about how, this, how successful this has been. So anyway, in the beginning, they did a draft with the treatment community, many of you. They brought them in, the counselors. They communicated with the defense lawyers. I mean, folks, you know what this shows? This shows that good policy takes some hard work. You know, I know what we love to put it on a bumper sticker and say, Portugal because that fits on a proper sticker, right? You, you know, follow Portugal, right? I know we want to say, you know, you know um, regulate and, and tax and, you know, that's easy. The stuff that's going to work is going to take a little bit of hard work. You're going to have to get your hands a little dirty, and I hate to say it, but the reason is because this is a complex issue. As you all know, simple problems are not, uh, simple solutions, right, are, are not going to work for complex problems like this one. Anyway, they did a draft, they wrote a consensus, that this was their own work, and they engaged you know, people from all over the community, and in May, they basically had a big press conference and they implemented this in the, in the city of Ghent, Belgium. And basically what it is, is they had an introductory session where there was a, with, with the person using drugs and committing crime, they had to be willing to enter the program. They did that, they had a session where they have you know, a proposed treatment plan. Everybody's treatment plan is going to be different. As you know, the paths to recovery are many, right? There's no one size fits all. There were follow-up hearings, right? So there was a hearing if you did, if you did a good job. It wasn't just a hearing if you got in trouble. <laughs> Isn't that a different way to think about it? The judge said, you did a good job. Come in here. I'm going to give you a 500 you know, euro gift card to Amazon. You know, you did a good job. I'm gonna, you know, you're gonna go to the movies to have a gift card for movies and dinner with your with a couple of your friends this this weekend. That keeps people going. Positive incentives, not just negative ones. You know, I mean, it's just amazing to me that we want to devote so much time to things like let's open an injecting room or legalize and legitimate use. What if we devoted a few minutes of that time to how can we positively encourage people in early recovery? No one's talking about that. Why aren't we talking about that? I know it's easier to use the easy term, but we have to talk about this. Judgment, uh, taking into account behavior of the accused, et cetera. In other words, if they change their behavior, then they have, they have a whole liaison that works on, you know, gosh, if you're a person in recovery, you need to learn, you need to learn how to be a, be a contrib contributing citizen. You know, you all know recovery isn't just the absence of drug use. It's like saying peace is only the absence of war. It's not. Recovery means you are contributing to society. You're a, you're a citizen. You're a full contribution to all the social spheres. So what does that mean? It means you have to learn how to pay taxes. <laughs> it means you have to learn how to manage your bank account. It means you have to learn, uh, you have to focus on your mental health. It means you have to make sure you have a stable housing environment that isn't full of people who are going to encourage you to use drugs again. This is the hard work, as you all are doing every single day. And you have to communicate to politicians about the hard work you're doing because they're not hearing it. You need to talk to them and tell them this is a complex issue and frankly it's offensive to have used these simple things that fit on a bumper sticker and instead aren't the complex issues. It's very important that you do that. Healthcare, they had a whole, anyway, the bottom line is they had a scientific evaluation and, and basically it was a wild success. Um, they have recidivism reducing 80%. Three quarters of them aren't reoffending within the first 18 months. That's an incredible number for people in the criminal justice system. We know that the minute you get arrested, the chances you get arrested again in your life go up 50-fold. So the fact that they're reducing it like this is amazing. Um, when they did the scientific evaluation, they found that, uh, yes, they still had a third of them reoffending. That's bad. 
but that was compared to over 56% if you weren't in that, uh, in, weren't in the drug treatment court. And guess what? They brought in people with heavy criminal records. I'm not talking about the guy that was with cannabis for the first time, although this model would work for them too. I'm talking about the person who society has almost given up on. You're a junkie, you're an addict, you're, you're committing crimes. Just enough is enough. Your life's over, you're going behind bars forever. They worked with those people too. And last week, um, and I don't even know if this is public knowledge because I met with the judge a couple days ago and I said, I need a few of your slides. So anyway, I, this is being recorded, but that's okay. Last week, the ministers of, uh, of justice and health have said, this has been such a success in Ghent. We are expanding this all over the country. That's the kind of thing you need to do here. You know, if you want to put an injection room, wonderful, but put in 10 drugs courts too. <laughs> if you want to decriminalize, we think that there are better ways. You know, have a more robust, and a lot of people say, well, you know, the, the drug court is still a court, but it's a specialized court. It's not the traditional court. So really, at the end of the day, just to conclude, we need robust solutions because this is a very difficult problem and it doesn't fit on a bumper sticker. We need, the best treatment is prevention, as you all know, right? I, you know, I feel like sometimes in our countries, this is both in the U.S. and, and here in Europe, I feel like um, we are building a perfect ambulance on the bottom of the cliff. It's like all we're focused on. Now, I know, we need a good ambulance. Trust me. People are going to get in trouble. They're going to overdose. They need a really good ambulance. They need naloxone. They need, I, I'm not against that. I'm in favor of that. You need a nice ambulance, but you can't put all of your efforts in the ambulance. You've got to put your efforts in the counselor and the person before the guy jumps off the cliff and lands and then needs the ambulance, you got to have stopping points on the way to the edge of that cliff. And that's why early, early prevention and early intervention, you know, we have so many early interventions now, we didn't even have 10 years ago, screening brief interventions. And we have to teach the medical community this too. And I, I wish there were more, you know, GPs in the audience because frankly, you know, people say, we want to treat this like a medical issue. Okay, well, are you teaching about addiction in medical school? No, for a week. Okay. Well, are you, is it a specialty that you're encouraging people to go into? Well, it's kind of like that thing you do if, you know, you're not like doing the hard stuff, like the surgery, you know, and then you go into addiction, addiction medicine, psychiatry. It's that, you know, it's that stuff that goes on up here. It's not really. But we have to change that culture. There is that culture in medicine. And there's that culture in politics too. Do you know that um, Patrick... Uh, he, it was really, I, I give him the responsibility. There were a couple of people that helped him too, of course, and he always wants to share, you know, make sure that other people share the limelight, and, and as they should. But do you know that he and those other people convinced our Congress of something you're going to think is so progressive of us as Americans here? It only took our Congress a hundred years to codify in law and realize that the brain is part of the body. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that we always treated physical illness different than mental illness, as if they're different. We said, if you had an elbow that was broken, or you had, need a knee replacement, or you need a new hip, or you get into a horrible car accident, you need some kind of surgery, we got you covered. That's legitimate. But if you have something going on up here that's clouding your judgment and depressing you, and you're bipolar, schizophrenic, and that's just kind of something you need to get over, <laughs> right? Or just go to the church basement, they'll take care of you. The church basement will take care of you, but you know what else? You also need medical attention. That'll take care of you too. You need both. And so I think we have a tendency in society, and when Patrick talks about you know, his dad and talks about Teddy and talks about very bravely in the book about the denial and the Kennedy family of all these issues, the denial comes from this idea that what goes on up here is really just not legitimate medicine. And I, that idea is pervading the medical community. And you all are, have to be there to change it. You are not second-rate healthcare workers. You are on the front lines. You're dealing with the stuff going on up here that's just as important as if the guy needs a new knee. In fact, it's more important. Because if you don't get the new knee, you're not going to be a menace to society. Unless you're on a wheelchair that's out of control or something. But no, but you understand what I'm saying. So it, it is very important. We need international efforts. So we did launch SAM, and, and I just wanted to um, 
uh, put this up here as my last slide. This, our website is learnaboutsam.org. Everything I've said is basically there, infographics, toolkits, PowerPoint presentations, videos, talking points. If you have any questions, you can always email the office. This is my direct email. You can always email me. And um, I just want to say it was really a privilege to be here. And uh, maybe later we'll have some time for the Q&A during the panel. But thank you all for having me. Thanks so much.